just ahead on American Black Journal. Reverend Horace Sheffield III is here to talk about his father's legacy in the labor movement and new plans to house his archives. Plus, we'll hear from this year's Kresge eminent artist, Olayami Dobbles, about the inspiration behind his unique work. And we'll talk with artist Tylon Sawyer about the modern day messages in his art. Don't go away. American Black Journal starts now. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the Cynthia and Edsel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The DTE Foundation proudly supports 50 years of American Black Journal in covering African American history, culture, and politics. The DTE Foundation and American Black Journal, partners in presenting African American perspectives about our communities and in our world. Also brought to you by AAA, Nissan Foundation, and viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to American Black Journal. I'm Stephen Henderson. As we celebrate Black History Month, we want to remember an African-American leader in organized labor, the late Horace Sheffield Jr. As a young auto worker at Ford, he rose through the ranks of the UAW and played a huge role in expanding the influence of Blacks in the Union. Sheffield was also a civil rights activist and a close ally to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I spoke with his son, Reverend Horace Sheffield III, about preserving his father's legacy. I'm really excited to talk to you uh, about your dad uh, and the work that you're doing to preserve, you know, his archives and his and his legacy. But but I figure uh, we we probably ought to start with just a, a simple recitation of who your dad was, mm -hmm. what he did, and why he's so important, not just to the legacy of labor here in uh, the city of Detroit, but especially to the, the legacy of civil rights. Uh, he, yeah. he really was something else. Well, you know, and, and my dad, uh, much like me, was not a self-promoter. You know, he, he was a race man. And in that generation, as you know, because your family is a part of that, these are people who deferred their own aspirations for future generations to experience what they never had an opportunity to. So it wasn't about them getting the job it was about opening the door, making certain other folks came in. But I, I think uh, Willie Felder opened my eyes to who my dad was uh, at his 100th birthday celebration and told me he was in Birmingham, Alabama. And uh, Dr. Uh, A.G. Gatson, who was a, a millionaire, invited my dad down, and my dad brought Thurgood Marshall with him. Uh, and they were having a meeting because these Black veterans who had come back from the war were being discriminated against, not able to get the, you know, the, the veterans' loans, and so he said, when my dad walked in the room, everybody knew who he was and knew that things were about to get started now. So my dad's history is this. He, he by the way, was vice president of the Negro American Labor Council on A. Philip Randolph. He and Baird Rustin served in that same capacity. Both of them were the staff organizers of, of the, the March on Washington for uh, jobs in the war industry. And of course, was the first person to bring Dr. King to Detroit. What people don't understand is the success of the civil rights movement is because you have black labor organizers. Also, one tidbit is in his archives is that I discovered that he was the first person that they asked to be mayor to run as a black mayor. And my dad loathed politics. Uh, so it was very interesting that my daughter would become uh, president of the council. But one good example, five plus one, they went down and met with Mary and Van Antwerp because of police brutality, mm -hmm. the big four and all those things. And if you read B.J. Wittig's book, you know that they brought the Klan here and Charles Bowles almost won the mayor's race in the 20s to discourage the growth of the black population. And the police took on that, uh, that, that, uh, that uh, mantra. And, and when they went down and met about what was happening, they said, that's what we do to <laughs> It's in my dad's archives. And what did they do? My dad came back to TUFC, had a big meeting and organized a slate called Five Plus One. The one was Jerry Cavanaugh 
and five liberal council, and they won. They beat the UAW. They beat the white power structure. And that was a powerful moment in the history of TULC and Black trade unionism, which my dad was a part of. And, you know, just hearing you talk about those things, those events, uh, you know, those, those moments uh, in, in history, you can connect so much of what we see and experience today in Detroit to those moments that, yes. that, that things are the way they are for us in particular uh, in the city because of those things that, yes. that, that your dad and those other folks did. Yeah, so what's interesting is the same person who did Daisy Bates and Robert Kennedy and Jackie Robinson's archives, we spent $90,000 digitizing this and kind of tongue in cheek, the, the white guy says, you know, this, this is one of the best collections. He didn't want to say period, you know, <laughs> but really my dad had already annotated everything. I mean, back to a, a, a pamphlet he wrote with a pseudonym called Unite Regardless, encouraging black workers to join the UAW of which my grandfather didn't until after it was accepted by the, you know, the collective bargaining agent. My grandfather thought that Henry Ford was the second coming of Jesus Christ. <laughs> but my dad saved absolutely everything. And what's important to me about all of this is that if I, you know, you have family members, for example, that were in the trade union movement, right? You can literally pull up people's names, people that folks, everyday people don't know that I and uh, Ann Jones or, you know, George Cherry. I mean, and you will find information that my dad has. I, I don't run in my mouth, but I'm so excited about this. But one of the, the most important pieces that I've read recently, and by the way, my dad took me where so I was able to connect the dots, was when he came home from King's funeral, having walked behind his coffin, and, and, and African-American trade unionists were absent from, from Memphis, and some of them were absent from the funeral because the white unions had turned against Dr. King because of his stance on the Vietnam War. And this five page letter my dad wrote to black trade unions asked the question, when are we even as a part of white institutions not gonna be afraid to stick up for our own interests? They stick up for theirs and make us bow to theirs. When are we gonna make them bow to ours? Wow. So, yeah. so um, I, I know you're doing this work now, uh, trying to, to preserve his legacy and his, and his archives. But I want you to talk just a little about growing up with yeah. your dad. I mean, this was your dad. He wasn't just a civil rights activist. Uh, you know, this was the man who raised you. Uh, talk about the things that, that you believe and the things you work on today that, that, that are, were influenced by growing up in a household with him. Well, you know, my dad's favorite question he asked in any meeting that he was uh, organizing uh, for an issue was, what's the difference between a pile of bricks and a cathedral, and no one would get it. He'd always say, organization, the bricks are organized. So one of the things I got out was, by the way, this hu humongous movement. I mean, the, 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 the social upheaval and all that you saw happen, I was there in that cauldron, in that crucible. I mean, I, I, I watched Dr. King speak. I, you know, I went to Walter Ruth's funeral. I mean, these are things that I, 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 I experienced. And I asked myself, unlike the day with, when people would TikTok it and, and Instagram it and Facebook it, I asked myself, why, why was I providentially placed in this era to be exposed to these people and to know them by name and you know, sleep in, in King's house and all that? And I came away with it that I was to carry on the legacy of selfless service. Uh, my dad said the true measure of a person's life is not how much they have, but how much they give. And I really think that came home in 63 when we went to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. And Lyndon Johnson received my dad and my sisters and I at his house. And my sister swam in his swimming pool uh, as my dad met with Lyndon Johnson. And I didn't come out of there thinking, oh my God, I'm somebody, you know, look at us. I came away from there knowing that my dad was a pivotal a uh, pivotal, uh, pivotal uh, person in the movement for civil rights and that this blue collar worker, he was a blue collar worker. My grandfather had a fourth grade education, came out of the foundry at Ford, organized workers. And his, and his they called him the champion of the working poor and blue collar workers. That took him into Lyndon Johnson's front room and was known by him and by name. And I, by the way, I got an interesting story about Lyndon Johnson. It's in his archives, you want to hear? And it's, it's timely because Abram Cohn, 
wrote this and told me it's in the archives that that Lyndon Johnson called my dad. He was the floor general at the convention and asked my dad not to see uh, 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 the lady from Mississippi. What's her name? Um, Fatty Lou Hamer. Oh, really? And Abram Cohn was standing next to him, and he told Vice President or President Johnson that uh, that he would not uh, not seat those delegations uh, who were, who were delegates of Fannie Lou Hamer. And uh, you know, I love Abram Cohn, by the way. You know, he he contributed a lot of stuff to my dad's um, uh, archives and brought a lot of stuff together for me. He's part of that Black Jewish coalition that began, you know, back in the '40s and '50s that really desegregated the city. So, so I think for anybody who is looking for an obvious um, uh, sign of uh, the, the power of your dad's legacy, of course, your daughter is right. now, you know, a great symbol of that. She's right. the president of the Detroit City Council. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I also wonder if you look around the city and, and see other things that, um, that for you are, are a, a reminder of all mm -hmm. of the things that he did. Well, I'm gonna be perfectly honest with you. When I set out to do this collection, the only support I got was from my sister LeVon who passed, mm -hmm. who wrote a $50,000 check. The rest of it I had to raise. The UAW put in some money. Some of their archives have been lost mm -hmm. uh, and I'm working on an agreement with him. But Dr. Mm -hmm. Dr. Curtis Ivory at Wayne County Community College embraced this project, helped me raise the money and uh, actually spent money to have an architectural layout and the build out for where this is going to go. So now Wayne State, you know, I've yielded to Wayne State. I wanted to be broader because my dad was broader and I knew the issues he had with Walter Ruth. And when I talked to them, they knew they were issues. So mm -hmm. we've addressed those, but I'm excited. And I think, you know, when I look around town, that community college with that many young African-Americans who are getting an opportunity to go to college and go on, my wife, my wife who grew up uh, on the east side went to Kettering, fatherless, you know, almost homeless as a teenager, went to that college and she now is practicing medicine in the city of Detroit. Yeah. So I think that's a powerful thing because one of the things you know and I know is what they always believed was that education was the great game changer. Everything. It was everything to them, yeah. Um, so, so for just average people who might want to access this, learn about your dad, uh, see this legacy, they can just go to, to the Wayne State, to the Ruther. To, well, it's not up on the platform yet, it will be. What's gonna happen is Wayne will house it. It'll be shared with Wayne County Community College District where actual physical artifacts from the archives will be, be on display. We're hiring a guy named Joseph Wilson out of New Jersey, who was one of the foremost labor, black labor historians in, in the world. Uh, who, you know, when I called him, he told me stuff about my dad, you know, uh, and we're going to be excited because we're going to be doing seminars. And here's the, re here's the real power of this. The real power of this is these rank and file people, Mickey Welch and people like that I grew up with, uh, you know, uh, the, the Thomases, the Dillards, will now have an opportunity for their lives to be opened up to others so that people understand it doesn't take a whole lot of folks, doesn't take grand folks, it takes just committed folks. Uh, and these blue collar rank and file people change the history of this city and this nation. Now let's turn to the 2022 Kresge eminent artist. Oliyami Dombles is the recipient of this year's honor, which celebrates lifetime achievement in art and comes with a $50,000 prize. 73 year old Dombles is well known for transforming a neglected area on Detroit's west side into an African centered cultural attraction. Visitors from all over the world have traveled to the corner of Grand River and West Grand Boulevard to see his handiwork. Producer Marcus Green paid a visit to Dombles Embad Bead Museum to learn more about the artist's unique brand of visual storytelling. I'm a storyteller, which is a title that comes out of uh, Africa and most cultures who lived close to the land. They had people who told stories. The concept of being an artist is, is relatively new within the last maybe 500 years. Prior to that, each culture had people that were there and their responsibility was to communicate through what that particular culture group called the symbols, uh, their colors. And now today, 
all of that has just been thrown into one big pot and referred to as art. But that term is deceptive because it's not art. It's more material culture than it is art. But when you talk about material culture, you're actually talking about the culture group, the group itself, what they have left behind. And most cultures, that which would be defined as art, is uh, destroyed if it does not serve the purpose because it's made to solicit and engage an ideal or a concept. And if that's not achieved, no one would just keep it around because of the aesthetics of it. It's my responsibility to remind people from which they came. And since uh, I'm dealing with the African experience, it meant that for a period of, let's say, 500 years, our history, our culture has been deliberately uh, ignored, destroyed, or uh, claimed by others. It was only when I discovered African material culture and I had to figure out what will I be able to talk about without getting sidetracked with the, the people being afraid of what I'm trying to introduce them to. And that's where the bees came in. There's no difference in the use of beads, textiles, carving, sculpture, mask, and utilitary items in Africa. They all serve the same purpose. So that's why I gravitated towards beads. Now that I got these beads, how do I get people to take note? Even the display of the beads, I have to go through it and uneducation I'd educate myself because we based everything we're doing based on the European model. The European model says that if you got a museum, things have to be presented in a certain way. You got to have captions. You got to have a staff to research the caption. So I had to deal with this idea of, do I want to meet European museum standards? Or do I want to display these bees so my people could see them? So I had to manufacture it so others could see it without me saying a word and yet communicating with them. Then it dawned on me that the Europeans who traveled throughout Africa, all the things they deemed to be significant that they collected and stole uh, were given to them. There was no captions on these items. So once I got over that huddle, then I'm able to display the bees and where people can come in here and just enjoy the energy of having them around. I'm still, it's still me, but I'm displaying who I am to, to people so they can see what I know. So I said, okay, I need some curb appeal. So I got to put stuff on these buildings that would appeal to the palette of African people. So now I'm still using symbols. I'm using uh, images that have been in our cultures for thousands of years. When I began to put these images on the building, I was attracting anyone who saw them. So I said, okay, now I have all this information in me. I've spent 15 years at the African American Museum studying the history of Africans in this country. And I spent another 15 years studying the history of Africans on the continent. I'm not so much concerned about legacy as I am as uh, impacting, uh, influencing people during my own lifetime. My concern is to make sense out of the nonsense stuff that I, I am in and I'm beginning to, to figure my way out of. And I know that someone else will be able to unwrap some other information. It is a continuation. It took us about 400 years to get here. But each generation moves us even closer back to from which we came. Because there's nothing else around here like this. That means that it found a place in the community and it coexists with everything around it.
And there's another Detroit artist who's having his work recognized. Tylon Sawyer's art will be on display inside and outside of an affordable housing project planned for the city's northwest side. The building on West McNichols will be named Sawyer Art Apartments in honor of the artist. One Detroit associate producer, Will Glover, sat down with Sawyer to talk about the contemporary messages in his work. So Tylon, the themes of your work delve into the cross sections of race, politics, identity. Um, when you create this work, who is it for and, and what do you hope that they get out of it? I guess you could specifically say like white people, but that's not necessarily the case because I consider myself American. And when I refer to like the founding fathers, I noticed that I put R in front of it, right? So like, obviously that's a, that's a type of ownership that I take on. Some other people may not. Um, but even I would say, I bet you if they're American, somehow subconsciously, they still maybe think that way. And so creating works like that, um, similarly that to, to, to most things that, that I do, I think that it's about getting the viewer to engage with our history and even recent history in a more thoughtful way than just a romanticized way that we become accustomed to it. You know, I, I hope that my art does sort of influences younger people or people to think um, in a much more nuanced way about these problems. Because um, we have heavy handed problems, but they're so intricate, it's hard to just say, do this and this will fix that, you know. Um, you know, defund the police, that's going to, that, that is that, that's what's going to stop all of the, you know, like, like I, and I, I get yeah, where yeah. it comes from, but I mean, like, it's such a complicated problem. Um, you know, like, you can't just use, you know, like something that needs a scaffold, you come in with, you know, like a sledgehammer or something like that. Like, there's, they, that's, unfortunately, that's the way I think that how we've gotten to where we are socially in this country. And so a lot of my work, kind of deals with that. Like you mentioned that painting, like a gentle reminder, you know, and it's a black power fist with butterflies on it that have, but instead of the monarch um, designs, it's a Confederate flag, you know, yes. and butterflies are a metaphor for reincarnation in certain Eastern religions. And so racism kind of simply reincarnates itself in a different way. It's not that good old boy mass lynching pickup truck or like angry, um, you know, like Southern Confederate sort of thing now. Now it takes place subtly in boardrooms. It's policies that disproportionately affect people of color. It's um, the, the way that we may not see people who look like us on television shows. When we do see folks that look like us on television shows, it's a script written by a person who never lived our life. So when we hear the dialogue, it's there's a <laughs> disconnect from like who I am versus like who this, who they're presenting like on television. And so yeah, like when when I I don't know my work, I try to pay attention to like those little subtleties, the little the little things that are causing these bigger problems, you know, like because a lot of times that's what it is. It's just a bunch of little things that compound themselves into these big mass problems. So, as an artist with a resume like yours, what advice do you give to artists who you know want something similar for themselves? Usually, it's young people and. I would say you, you have to have hard work and you have to have passion. Like all these things have to kind of coalesce at the same time. Like my work is heavily research driven. Uh, my paintings are very laborious. I spend a lot of time like working on them. Sometimes it happens quick, but that isn't the case the majority of the time. Um, like I say, how many books I have to read, the networking aspect of it. It's a lot of hard work. It exhausts you. And sometimes you have to be pushed um, and, and, and you have to push yourself because no one else is going to do it. Um, we live in a time where a, a big, a, a big chunk of the messaging to younger people about safe spaces, take your time, you know, like um, your anxiety, you know, like take care of yourself, your anxiety, you know, self care. You should have been doing. You should, yes, you should take care of yourself. Um, but all humans have anxiety. I don't know. I I have a lot of anxiety right now. <laughs> yeah, you know, just from teaching and job, and I can imagine what you do. Like this is just a part of the human condition. Um, and I've often, and I don't know, like from what I see, the narrative seems to make these aspects, which are the tribulations, and but they are average parts of the human condition, and they're given like the special credence to stop people from putting their best foot forward. Um, I do think that you should address those issues via therapy or whatever it takes, what is considered self-care, self, self, self -care. but simultaneously, 
man, I get in the studio and I work. Like I come from a blue collar family who who went to, you know, they go to work every day to, to take care of their families, their homes. And so I have to go to work every day, rather I'm teaching when I'm not teaching, I need to be in the studio doing the same thing with that type of ethic. Um, yes, it's a lot of hard work and I am drained at the end of the day, but man, what a labor of love. What, what's, what great problems to have, to be exhausted from painting rather than filling out TPS reports in the office. And I made a very conscious decision to change my life to what it is now and be an artist and be an educator. And I'm a thousand times happier. That is gonna do it for us this week. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about our guests at AmericanBlackJournal.org. And you can always connect with us on Facebook and on Twitter. Make sure you join us next Tuesday, February 22nd at 7 p.m. for a special one hour show about our Black Church in Detroit initiative. Take care and we'll see you next time. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the Cynthia and Edsel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The DTE Foundation proudly supports 50 years of American Black Journal in covering African American history, culture, and politics. The DTE Foundation and American Black Journal partners in presenting African American perspectives about our communities and in our world. Also brought to you by AAA, Nissan Foundation, and viewers like you. Thank you.